So I'm going to be going live now. This okay. is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com with none other than WWE Hall of Famer, the man who was in the first WrestleMania, tons of WrestleManias. He main evented Starcade for WCW. He was recently featured on Dark Side of the Ring. Brutus the Barber Beefcake, how are you doing today, sir? <laughs> I am doing so good. It's, it's, it's insane. I, I mean, I am so doing happy well, blessed. My life, things are going great. My wife, she's tremendous. I mean, it's just, it's better than I could have ever imagined it would be a few years back. It was really looking bleak and things really turned around. Speaking of looking bleak, before we went on, you just reminded me of a time in Calgary when I tried to do a show there and the, the ring truck broke down and we had like 700 people in the crowd and they ended up just getting your autograph because right. they didn't show up. There was no show. <laughs> Bad night for me, oh. but uh, at least the fans got to see you. Hey, we had fun with the fans. We, we did the best we could. We could sometimes that's what you got to do. And in, in our business, uh, you know, can't always uh, go the way you want it. But I, I do remember you paid me for being there, which probably, Half the guys, the promoters in this country, or more, would have backed, would have balked, and not really would, you know. And you, you were right up the front. You, were, you know, I'm, I was a long ways from home, too. <laughs> so, but I mean, yeah, that just goes to show you, you're, you're a good man. Appreciate it, and you are too. I don't know why people pick on you sometimes. Why do you think that is? Just jealousy of your oh. success. <laughs> God, I don't want to hit that too hard, but, but you know, you watched the dark side, obviously, right? Yeah, I, I saw it. Yeah. I mean, there's good, to, there, you know, there's a, there's, there was, you know, some things, I don't know how they were wrong, but mostly it was all good. And, 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 you know, the, the people were talking about, you know, Brutus and his gimmicks. He had so many gimmicks. And there's so many, wow, the, this, the, this, the gimmicks, too, too many names, too many gimmicks. And I tried to explain to him, you know, Vince McMahon tried trademark my name in 1990 before anybody knew about things before that accident and all that. And, and it, when, when that, that accident changed my whole life. And, and, and so it kind of really limited me with WWE where I was going to go. And so we Hulk and I moved on to making movies and TV shows and, and, and going to work for WCW and then, so I, I had to create some personalities, but almost every single one of those personalities wound up being in main event pay-per-view matches. Okay. So how can half these guys have never been in a main event pay-per-view match in their life? Make fun of me saying, oh, Brutus is a really gimmick. And this again. Hey, I just got called upon, step into a role, like, like, bam, do something, boom, throw me on, a, and I could be a pay-per-view and, and help draw money to their to their cause and everything. How can that be a bad thing? I, I, and, and I, or why would it show that I am not a good wrestler? It would show that I am an exceptional wrestler because I can change, change boats, Mid while we're while we're going eighty miles an hour, I jump to the other boat and keep going. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I think it was Starcade '94 when you were the butcher taking on Hogan. That actually had a bigger crowd in Nashville than Flair against Steamboat that everyone talks about. <laughs> but people that, will man. never give you your due on that. It had a good pay per view buy rate as well. You know, I, I only say that I thank God every single day. I pray so much. He has blessed me so much. I have just been, you know, able to do things. And and sometimes I guess, you know, there. <laughs> I tell my wife all the time, hey, you know, you're not bad. These people that are, talk about you, are, they're only jealous. And, I mean, you know, it, tell it's. Tell us what I call Rick Will. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, I noticed uh, Nobbs took a shot at your acting. Is is yeah. that because oh, maybe yeah. uh, he wasn't in as many movies as you? <laughs> God. You know, the that's I doubled Hulk and and did stunts in probably eight eight movies and nine, ten movies and television series that went 22 episodes and it only got dropped because the greedy the greedy production people that did Baywatch you know over there on the California beach for years and years and they stole so much money it's mind blowing <clears throat> and they came to Florida and they thought they could get away with the whole thing. And Reicher Entertainment, who was sponsoring the thing and putting up all the money, they went back and looked at the books and they go, well, Jesus, you got there, there's 20 people that are on the books as your family. <laughs> what? And then the FedEx and the and the FedEx bill was $250,000. I mean, money just disappeared everywhere. So at the end, after the show, the people the people looked at the thing, they go, Hey, it was a great show, and we love it, but we just can't put up the money again and see it all go out the window. Yeah, and it was a pretty good show, and you were in, I know you were in Mr. Nanny for a little bit. Uh, and Stand of the Muscles, Ultimate Stand Weapon. Two, uh, ultimate two Navy weapon, you had a real role too, right? Yeah, you had a they had a role in Ultimate Weapon. And I spoke, and it, but you know, the the Navy SEAL, the two Navy SEAL movies we did for for TNT with Carl Weathers and Marty Crove and Marty Marty Cove. Sorry from from the uh, you know the Karate Boy, Karate Kid movies, uh, Billy Drago, and then Touchables, and done a million movies, all kind of. Uh, uh, all kind of people. Shannon Tweed was in that one, uh, a couple of our episodes uh, in, in those two movies. And uh, what an unbelievable person. Really, I was just so lucky to be able to hang out and meet her and to, to be with uh, the, the head guy from Kiss. What's his name? Um, Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons. To be with him, uh, you know, and and she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she, didn't, she you know, she was like saint-like. We, we, me and Hulk tried everything to, to, to get her, to corrupt her, you know, to, to have a beer with us on the set after these 20-hour days and stuff. We're all like, oh, ooh, ooh. and she was just beautiful and looking good and just happy and, 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 and it's just so pure. It was like, Wow, this is so weird because this to this woman to be with Gene Simmons and I met once or twice, but he, I mean he is just cuckoo. He's crazy. And if he hadn't done everything in the world twice, I don't know who has. And and for her to be, you know, make a family with him and and, and probably be the only woman that could ever rein in Gene Gene Simmons. She did it. It's unbelievable. Definitely. Someone's bringing up here. You did Hogan's stunts in Suburban Commando. Is that true? Absolutely. That's, you know, with Chris Lloyd, Shelley Duvall, Jack Elam, one of the old the guys sitting in the Jeep with, with, talking was from all the old Westerns and John Wayne movies and stuff. I sat for hours talking to him about the old John Wayne movies. because I'm a huge John Wayne fan. And, and Chris Lloyd, <laughs> I love that guy. He's just crazy. And, and I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of comic cons. I did Australia. I think I did New Zealand. He was, he was there and, and he and I were sitting in the green room talking and, and just going through old times and talking and, and just some of the actors I've been fortunate, fortunate enough to, to work with and be, be around and just, just always trying to, to learn and, and absorb, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the greatness of these people. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to be around them. One thing I can confirm that's true with you is that you don't have a, a criminal record because you've come <laughs> to Canada all the time. I think you've been at least 10 times for me over the years. 
So I can confirm for the story that they tried to say about you uh, on the subway on Dark Side of the Ring. Oh, that if yeah, if you had been caught with something, wouldn't you have a criminal record? Well, uh, absolutely. And and here's the thing. well, this this is the simplest thing to think about. Okay, the <clears throat> the place where I was this this toll booth <clears throat> token booth where I was sitting was called Downtown Crossing, and a bunch of the the lines all run into that. And there's, that was shut down for hours. That alone must have cost a half a million, a million dollars being shut down. And you think if these Boston police found cocaine in my booth, they wouldn't have tried to sue me and put that bill on me going, you just caught, you know, doing drugs in the booth. I mean, it sounded bad. But I, I still use those same aspirin BC powders today because they work. There, there, there's several different pain relievers that you can use in that powdered form. And it's not such a stretch that I had one in my bag and it fell on the floor and the girl picked it up and it was like, poof. and she's uh, wearing a black and this real fine dust like thing went on her. First thing she started yelling was anthrax. It's anthrax. I mean, I don't know who would I ever thought of that it was back in that time, I guess, I, you know, and, but, uh, you know, th that says it all. The Boston police, you know, they never filed anything on me. And, you know, they sure would if they could have, you know, they, that's the way it yeah. was back then. And they don't even let Americans with DUIs into Canada. So oh, I know you definitely didn't have any charges there. Um, somebody wants to know about working for Jake Roberts in the UK. Do you have any memories of that? <laughs> I love Jake. Um, yeah. Well, I know Jake was with a, with a girl for a while that was from there. I know she was kind of sponsoring him, whatever. And then uh, me, Doug and Honky contacted us about going over and, and doing a show. So we all did. And, um, it was like, you know, everybody makes their own deal and everything. But like most of the time I get paid every night. That's, that's the old school way. They used to do it in the 70s and the 60s. Every night you got your payday, your payoff. Didn't change till later. So it's like third third day into the, to the deal. And we're at a, a pretty good, a, a beautiful arena. And there's like... Almost, you know, maybe a ah, hundred or 200 people there, definitely not paying the rent and, and paying all the guys we got. And I, I went to honky. I said, well, did you get paid? And he, no, no. I said, I went to Doug and I was like, Hey brother, did you, did you get paid? Have you been paid? No, no. I said, okay. You guys can do whatever you want on this, but as far as I'm concerned, I need to get paid. And then I'll wrestle tonight. No problem. Happy as a clam. And when I went and told Jake that, oh, he, he got he got upset and you know and everything. But then guess what? He paid. He paid all of us that night and stuff. And then, you know, we finished out the tour. Everything was great. I went back to the States. And then when I got home, there was something on the internet about me trashing a hotel room and God, I think it's London somewhere in the suburbs or whatever around London that I trashed the hotel rooms. And before I left, cause I was mad or something. I was like, okay, I've only been in uh, 10, 5,000 hotel rooms for 40 years in the business. And I've never trashed a hotel room ever. So why would I do it when I'm over there with Jake? I don't know. They just made it up because Jake was mad at me. And he said, but all that, you know, it's, it was just the, the times were a lot different. Then. What do you think about Jake getting uh, his AEW contract extended, even though they barely use him? It seems like a pretty good deal some guys have over there. 
Oh man, hey, I love it. That's fantastic. I'm so happy for Jake. Uh, Chris Jericho's a good friend, and, and he's he, uh, my grandsons love the AEW. They love some of the guys there. Chris was fantastic and did like birthday shout outs for my grandsons and stuff. He is this amazing guy. And, uh, I, you know, anybody can get gets a deal and can keep a deal. It, amazing. I, I wish I had one. But, you know, we're, we're doing okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll see in there one day because they do bring in the legends here and there. Do you think with Vince McMahon recently selling about $2 billion total worth of stock that there's any chance he's going to – jump back in the wrestling business apparently his no compete ends in january 2025 oh wow i, I will never wear that uh you know i don't know i the sense is getting old and uh i mean how much money do you need R really um he's done it all been there done done it all you know and then the latest stuff that's hit the the, you know the newsreels and stuff about him is not good. So I, you know, I mean, if I was him, I, I think I'd just stretch out on the beach in a nice chair, under the sun, sipping a pina colada, and go to Trader Vic's on the weekend and have hamburger. I don't, you know, what else? What does he in the Austin does he need to do? Are you gonna guess you always had a good relationship with him over the years? Mostly so, yeah. Yeah. Never spent a lot of time with him, but he was in Florida a few times and, and then got, I, you know, did, he did make a couple of stops down on Reddington beach and Hulk's townhouse down there on, right on the beach. We, we pull the th Donzi, Donzi uh, Z 33, 33 foot twin engine boat, anchor it right off the beach, you know, uh, nice pool down there, everything, on, you know, and Vince and Linda, both, and we hung out, you know, barbecued and, and did did our, you know, did our thing down there and on the beach and had a great time. Do you see him going to court with this woman now that she's already brought it all out? He really doesn't have anything to lose by, by taking it all the way, or do you think he's going to settle it again? You know what? I've been falling that too close. I don't have a clue. I really don't. I don't know what. Uh, I know it's not, the, the yeah going to you know denying it to the end. I I I think maybe that'd be good because if it's what I think you're talking about, it's so degrading and and, and demoralizing and and you know subhuman behavior that to admit to it be pretty serious i don't know how you come back from that did you actually leave wwe to go to wcw or was there a time in between there where you were a free agent <clears throat> definitely uh like a free agent there we after wrestlemania 9 while we were actually just after we just come out of the ring probably within 20 minutes 30 minutes we went over to another stage and filmed the interview for the Tokyo Dome. And he and I both went over and uh, wrestled the Tokyo Dome, I don't know, whatever it was, 75,000 or something. And um, geez, I, I picked up a better payday for an eight minute match with Masa Saito. Saito, the same one that was in with Kim Patera and went to jail and all that was the booker for new Japan and work with him like eight minutes, beat him and in, in, in right in the middle of the ring and made a better payday than I did for WrestleMania. <laughs> One, I don't know if we were considered a main event. I assume we were, we were tag world tag team match. I thought we actually won that match, but then they kind of flip flop switched around at the end there and realizing what they had done and said, oh, no, we can't can't give those two the belts because they're leaving. You know, going away. We were going to 
uh, film Thunder in Paradise, actually, the movie first that we filmed in uh, St. Pete Beach and all around and, and the surrounding islands and stuff. And then we started filming Thunder in Paradise, the television series at Disney. And then WW, uh, WCW was doing all their filming at uh, Universal Studios, I, th I guess, back then. So it was only natural that with WCW people everywhere all around us surround us in orlando while we're down there at the grand floridian and you know and and, and terry's bringing in you know terry Funk, and we had hercules we had this we had you know all the sting uh, the very first episode that they sold the show to disney with had me doubling hulk on a wave runner on a small little river there in Kissimmee f flying down this river in a, in, in a wave runner and roll up to a airboat with supposedly sting driving, but they had a guy underneath it they had, and they had it set up and without rehearsal, without ever even trying it before I come flying up from doing like 40 miles an hour, to probably 25, 30 next to the airboat, step off, reach up, grab a sting and start a big fight scene on the front of this moving airboat. And then boom, 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 go off in, into the water near the shore. And then one, and then boom, you got Hulk and the real sting pop up. I had me and the, and the doubles and they, the, the, the Disney watched this thing and they were like, oh my God, this is great. We love this. We had no idea that Hulk could do this kind of stuff. Oh my God. And they went, well, he didn't. They were like, what, what, what do you mean? They're like, that wasn't Hulk. That's his double. And they were like, going, what? Can we watch that again? And they watched it again. And they were like, "That that's a great double for Hulk. When you can't, when these guys who they produce TV, then they don't even know that it wasn't the real guy. That's, that's something to be proud of there, buddy. Cause I've been around the business a long time. I know I'm in the screen actors guild. I'm in the, I'm in after the American Federation for the, for the television actors thing. And, and have been since 1984, whenever we did the first, commercial for the Hasbro wrestling figures, a little wrestling guy with me in the pink tights going, eh, eh, and the, <laughs> did you get a good payday for that? By the way, we've heard <laughs> everyone got decent and different amounts. Yeah. I got not, a, not, a, I wouldn't consider it a great payday, but it, it was something back, back in the early eighties, I was scratching and scraping because I'd been, you know, uh, seven seven years running around the country and every territory um barely making a living you know thank god my family my mom and dad helped subsidize me a few times when i was really needed it and it kept me going and then went, once the opportunity came in uh 83 there to go, go you know go to events and and with this uh with the brutus beefcake and i came up with the outfits and stuff and they came up with the name and boom and and then get that chance, get that opportunity to go out on TV. <laughs> they went crazy. The people went wild. And then I guess they scratched their head and they said, yeah, I think this is really going to work really good. And then they ran with it. WrestleMania 1, you against David San Martino. Any memories of that? Looking at WrestleMania 40 now, did you ever think no. it would go this long? Never. I had no idea it was going to be like, going to 40. I thought I would have probably done a few more than I did, but the accident, that accident put a damper on things for a couple of years there, but I had actually got a chance to come back to WrestleMania nine, pretty much go out at WrestleMania on top, you know, get, getting our hands raised and having, you know, how many, God knows how many people were at, the, at a big outdoor show at, Caesar's Palace, whatever, and, and going crazy and stuff. And if, if it's going to be your last WWE match, that's a way to do it. 
Yeah, that's the way to go out. There's a fan on here that wants to know what your favorite WWE match was. Oh, probably um, me and Perfect in the WrestleMania six. WrestleMania match uh, number six was, you know, what we had seventy two plus thousand in uh, Tor- in Toronto at the in, at the indoor at the dome and. Uh, yeah, there's been uh, some people saying, uh, why was it you and not Hogan to end Mr. Perfect Street? Because he was feuding with Hogan at the time. Do you know whose call that was? Uh, I'm not sure whose call it was, but see, the thing was, I was getting, <clears throat> I was going to get the Intercontinental belt. They weren't going to put an Intercontinental belt on him. So why waste it? You know, if they're giving me the Intercontinental belt, boom, that was gonna happen and so they you know they, they we did the match who was to know that warrior's gonna come along and on uh, SummerSlam what was like 80 88 or everyone else gonna suppose you take the belt warrior decides that he's gonna quit if he doesn't get a belt and so they oh I think he, it may have been the accident that screwed you after perfect because wasn't it WrestleMania seven that you missed due to the accident? Right. But yeah, Warrior, you're also going to get the belt then. Oh, well, no, I was going to, yeah, no, I was going to get the belt uh, in, in uh, August of 1990 with that, or uh, August or September, whatever, whatever it was for the, the SummerSlam. And then, but the accident happened in July on July 4th. So that took that out. And I mean, it, that it changed the course of my life. And but I, I'm happy to be here, still be alive. I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't be alive. Probably the way uh, the way things turned out, <laughs> I'm awful happy. The doc, uh, he, he was on the dark side. My doctor, Doctor Matuz Habal, uh, from Armenia, a, a genius, a, a man who was years and years and years ahead of his time and he saved and helped countless uh children who are never would have never lived and he his his skills and and with the in in, a, in the operating room were amazing or he was so advanced and the reason and why he ever decided that he's going to help me i have no it's just a God intervened. It was an intervention there. He didn't operate on adults. He only operated on kids. And how they were able to wrangle this guy off the golf course into the hospital to see me, hopefully before I died, because I was in and out there, bouncing in and out. Me and I was up by the pearly gates there, checking it out, you know, and, and they yanked me back. And, and um, that doctor just said, we're going to operate on this, this kid. And, and uh, all the doctors looked at him and said, you're going to what? The guy, he, he's not going to, he's not going to live uh, 12 more hours. How, what do you think you're going to operate on? He's, he's this guy going to die. He's dead. He's dying. As we speak, he's dying. So, and, and the doctor says, no, we are going to do this thing. We're going to, we're going to, redo his face and called up all these doctors and all this equipment. And they had brought in, they had to bring in uh, 18 wheelers into the parking lot because the hospital had no facilities for a tr- trauma <laughs> and hundreds of thousands of dollars. The, the bill on this thing was like three quarters of a million dollars, a million dollars really to actually redo my face. And then the doctor knew that I was out of business and, you know, and I, I didn't really have insurance. So he like canceled all the other doctors pay, like said, this was on me. And and then, so the doctor's bill was like almost nothing. He, he did it. And I, I agreed to, to, uh, to do some stuff for him, which, which I did and go to speak to uh, parents of, of some of the children and people that come from all over the world 
some of the third world countries, all the third world countries that have no no way to help uh, kids born with cleft palates with their teeth, you know, half a mouth, their nose over here, either eye, one eyeball up here, one eye. This guy was so good. He could transform through a series of operations, transform these kids in, into a, a person that could uh, have a life and, and grow up and, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. I, I had no idea there was anybody out there that could do the things that this guy did. And, and uh, how, what's the luck of the, the how, how you call it luck that the accident occurred 30 miles from where his office, 20 miles from his office, his office could have been in, Catman do for all I, you know, in Budapest, in, in London, in Ireland. It could have been anywhere in the world, and I'd be dead. And it was in Tampa, Florida. And the accident happened just north of Tampa in a little city called Lutz, Florida. <laughs> God was on your side. Someone's <laughs> asking, do you have any permanent side effects from that? Does anything still bother you? I, I, you know, I get some headaches. I got some issues from my neck now. Um, my neck actually kind of fused itself solid. It's probably as a, some of the result of, of trauma from that event, but just wrestling 42 years. I mean, I mean, so my, I have limited motion. I, it's an inoperable thing because I went to everybody trying to see if they could something they could do because I can't, that size I can look up. I can't lift my chin up any farther than that or turn much farther than that. But it's a hell of a lot better than being dead. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Someone brings up it's uh would have been Piper's birthday today. Do you have any memories oh, of Roddy Piper? Oh, absolutely, man. Well, the, 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 I got all my inspiration to do barbershops after Roddy. We were great friends. I did a podcast. If you ever want to find some, find something, you will lab your cojones off. It's me and Snooka and Piper. It was one of the last podcasts that he he did when he was still before his you know he died of cancer before he before he died. And Pop, uh, Snooka had never definitely never done a, a podcast with with Roddy nor had I. We were in Orlando, Florida. At an event that day, and so we went to Roddy's room that night for a few hours and did the podcast. Man, whoo! That was there was some shit, stuff flying around that room, some serious questions asked and answered, and and I I know Jimmy my whole life. I, I love him, man. I, I, it was it's heartbreaking that he's gone too, and Rocky Rocky Johnson, uh, Dwayne's father, and just we've lost so many it's just it, it's it's tough i am just so happy to be here i mean it i heard recently this may have been before you got to wwe but there was some middle east tours uh in the early 80s that not a lot of people know about were you a part of any of those middle east tours because i i heard that jimmy snuck a kind of went a little off the wall on one of those, but it may have been before you joined the company. I think it was before I joined up. There was definitely a middle, some Middle East independent stuff that came down the pike. And I actually had, I actually had a, a, a visa to, to go to one of them. And then see, there was just too much, uh, too much going on over there. I, I opted out. I wasn't, they weren't going to change my life for the money they were paying me. And, and it just wasn't worth the aggravation of you know, maybe being kidnapped or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Involved in a bombing or something. Someone <laughs> wants to know, do you still talk to Greg Valentine often? Uh, Greg's out in Vegas. I haven't talked to him in a while. I always, I talk to him when I see him at shows and things like that. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I got a soft spot in, my, spot in my heart for Greg and blah, blah, blah. But I do want to clear up one kind of thing that Greg recently, fairly recently was on a podcast. 
And he called my wife a see you next Tuesday. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't think I've uh, seen this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a lot of people didn't, but that's still, that's no excuse. I know his wife, who we've had some round and round stuff. His, his wife has issues. Uh, her Missy, Missy tried to be nice to her so many times. It's ridiculous. And she went off, off the, off the rails and went cuckoo. And then I guess to pacify her, Greg went off the rails and went cuckoo on, on this podcast. But I mean, I, I I wish I had it. Missy has the video and the audio of some where she's going, Greg, did you call me a, but she didn't use the see you next Tuesday thing. Did you call me? And then Greg's like, uh, uh well, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> and she goes, oh, really? Am, am, am I, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's the funniest thing you ever saw. He's, he's trying to, he's, he's trying to, not trying to deny it, but then not doesn't even want to own up to it, you know. And he's like realizing, not a good thing, not a good move, not you know. It, 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 it. He's a good guy in some ways, in my experience, but he's not trustworthy in others. But he definitely has a good good side to him. He has a great side to him, no question about that. We we went through a lot together. I learned a lot being on the road with him in, in the New York and Jersey area. He helped to teach me those roads up there, brother. And I'm telling you, just surviving. If you can survive driving in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania for 10, 10, 12, 15 years, then you, you've you survived something because that's, that's like a demilitarized zone up there. It's crazy. Yeah, that turnpike is brutal. Someone wants to know about Ron Bass, one of your most famous feuds. Ron Bass. Well, when... Hulk and I uh, went to Memphis in 78, I guess early 78, and when Jerry Lawler was there for, for Jerry Jarrett. That's what they started calling him, the Hulk, Jerry, the Hulk. They did this video, and, and we were, we just come off the beach. And, you know, he was like 320, and I was probably about two, 250. I mean, and uh, they... Um, Ron Bass and he had a partner. They was a tag team with him and Pete Austin. We called him Pete Austin from Boston. And him and Ron Bass were together. Uh, and we actually had one of the matches I had in uh, Memphis on TV was with uh, Ron Bass was one of the guys. It was like a tag match. And I got gigged. And Bass gigged me and he hit a, he hit a vein. He hit a, a vein in my head and, and, Blood was squirting out of us. We had to X out the TV screen. And the blood, there was so much blood in the ring that it's like they, they people that had to wrestle after me, they were like, they couldn't even, they could hardly deal with it. The, the smell was horrible. The ring was, they had to wind up getting a whole new ring cover because so much blood. I almost had to stay the, host, the night in the hospital we wound up just finally just butterflying it. There was a, a guy there that helped. He spent a couple hours just trying to get the the, the, the cut closed up and, and to get it to stop bleeding and everything. And, uh, but, you know, that was that was in our first territory. So that, that was uh, pretty amazing. That was before the days where there's doctors in the back, so you get stitched up as soon as you get through the curtain. Yeah. Hey, uh, is there any chance you can give me like a minute or two here to? Yeah, uh, yeah. Take a quick, a little off-screen break. <laughs> that would yeah, be great. no, go, great. go ahead. I'll cut you off here. All right, fans. Uh, there'll be time for a few more questions once he gets back. A uh, very good interview so far. He cleared up a few things about um, Dark Side of the Ring and something I wasn't aware of that with Greg Valentine just there. Um, yeah, so he'll be back in a couple minutes. 
Apparently, Jack Kilby did an interview with Buff Bagwell last night, who is another guy that had a dark side of the ring um, earlier this year. So... Uh, we'll see what happens when he gets back. Brother Brutus was one of his names, yes. What made him quit WWE for WCW? He was a free agent doing uh, Thunder in Paradise at the time. Paul Stanley is the lead guy Sorry. from Kiss. Oh, he's back. <laughs> there he is. Uh, there's a fan question on here that uh, he wants to know about your disciple gimmick when you joined the NWO in 1998. Um, <clears throat> like, what kind of wants to know how that happened, I assume? like, Yeah, because you totally had – I mean, they went over it a bit in Dark Side of the Ring. You You disappeared for a while. You came back leaner than you've ever looked and, and your hair was different. Uh, yeah. Not a they, lot of people knew it was you right away. Well, we, yeah, uh, we, um, they, uh, they were in a position. WCW was, uh, was bitching about, we need more talent. We need more talent. We, uh, Hulk says, okay, well, you got, <laughs> we still couldn't use at that time. We still couldn't use Bruce Beefcake. It was still tied up in court, but, so you got Bruce Beefcake here. Well, 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 you've been so many Eric Bischoff says, hey, we've been all these guys. We, you know, we just can't repackage him anymore. He said, well, you got one a good, a really good worker here. You know, been a former world champion. You can't use him. And they were in, in there. Bischoff was determined. Absolutely not. We, we, you know, we just can't do anything more. Why does he hate you so much? I don't know. You talk about the J word, man. That, you know, he, he wanted to hang around Hulk. There was a time him and Jason Hervey, his his butt brother, I mean his partner, <laughs> and in uh, and Hulk would not hang out with him because me and me and him were running running wild all over everywhere. And uh, you know, it's just one of those things. And and he was just like determined. Oh, and then so I went back to Florida, like you said, dropped. Don't change, grow, grew the beard out. I was down to like five, six percent body fat. I was only, I went from 255 down to 220, 215, 220. I was wearing 30, went down to a 30 inch waist, still had 20 inch, 21 inch arms. <laughs> and we, I got the leathers and got the stuff, and then Hulk saw. And he was like, "Oh my God, they're not even going to believe this." So he made an appointment. We went down to CNN Center in Atlanta. I had my my gear on, you know, up the elevators and CNN people. People were giving us the looks. Go into the the office with all Bischoff's people, and I think Kevin Sullivan was there. It was. It was a bunch of people in the room. And Hulk marches me in there, and everybody's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Who is this guy? And Hulk says, ah, this is my new disciple. And everybody's looking at me, and they're going, wow, man, this guy looks great. You know, like, can he work? What was, what, what? And then he says, oh, yeah, I, I guess I don't need to introduce you to Brutus Beefcake. <laughs> and the people's faces hit the floor. They their mouths hung open. They couldn't believe it. Because nobody knew it was me. Nobody. And half the people ran out of the room. They were so embarrassed. And so I mean, yeah, okay, there there's they they he got me a deal. I had, you know, I had a paycheck. And that was that was the whole uh you know the whole story you know all the you get a million people here you're paying what you know give give brutus a payday too for crying out loud you know he he deserves it as much as all these other people and and then and besides that he can actually wrestle and you know so but then it wouldn't let me do anything 
the disciple <coughs> walked out and carried the belt. I did. There was a, in some of the house shows I went out. I, I, I had my hope. My uh, I think called it the apocalypse. It's kind of similar. It was actually what I was doing, and then Diamond Dollar, Dallas Page started copying me, and then called it the Diamond Cutter. <laughs> so I really stole my finish because he had all the airtime and I wasn't on. So it wasn't much, you know, I just kept doing what I was doing. I'd go out there and give the apocalypse to people and, you know, in, in some of the towns and whatever, a couple of the towns, but, you know, I was, I was just happy to, to, to be able to get a payday and, you know, support my family. You know, that's, that's what we're all doing here. Right. Definitely. Did you ever wrestle Andre the Giant? Someone's asking. Oh yeah, absolutely. But not not in a single. Andre only worked a couple of single matches that I know of. I know probably Big John Stud was one of them. Hulk was one of them. But you know, he always was. He did tag matches. He'd do uh, uh, a match with two or three different opponents sometimes. Handicap match, I guess they call that. So mostly, I I read a lot of a lot of tag matches and um, battle royals. You know, Andre would you know hit the country back when we had territories everywhere, and uh, he came into uh, Oregon and did a did a, a battle royal for uh, Don Owen out there in uh, Olympia uh, in Washington at a big show out there. We I know he he came he was he was where he came into. Mobile, Alabama, or wherever we were. I think we, I mean, Harley Race was there. It was, we had good, ta- good, good talent stuff all the time. And so, I mean, I, I met Andre in '78 when I first went to New York. And <clears throat> lucky for me, he liked me. You know, the, a lot of guys he didn't really like. And, and so, I mean, he kind of let you know and stuff. So I always had a good relationship with him. It's in the ring a lot of times with him. I've seen what he did to Jake after Jake put that snake on him and he's deathly, deathly, deathly scared of of the snakes and Jake put the snake on him on purpose. You know, I saw Andre do some things to Jake that I, I, I I don't know how he even lived through it. So I'm standing on Jake. That guy weighed 600 pounds standing on Jake. Holding on the ropes, standing there, with Jake. I thought he would just flatten him. He just <clears throat> squished the guts right out of him. And then he, he, Jake got his hair always wet and long and stringy. And Andre would step when, it, you know, Jake was down. He'd step on his hair and then grab him by the head and then slowly just pull him up and just rip the hair right out of his head. <laughs> And I'll be, I'll be watching this. And I'm like, Jake, I guess you shouldn't have put that snake on Andre. I mean, it would have been fine if you didn't have to wrestle him, but not a good idea to piss a giant off. Not a good idea. Is, is it true that at one point uh, he had like a bowel movement on Bad News Brown or something? Or is that a an old wives' tale that there was a rumor that he... St- he was wrestling bad news or something and he sat on him and he had diarrhea or something. You know what? I can neither confirm or deny that, but I, I can say that I think I was on that tour. I don't think I've witnessed that, but I did witness bad news <clears throat> calling Andre out of the bus one day. And around the time you're talking about and Andre didn't come out. <laughs> so I don't know if they worked it out ahead of time, whatever happened, but it, you know, not like Andre's scared of anybody, but bad news, bad news was pretty bad, much bad news. That guy was, he was a world champion judo expert his whole, his whole life. So he was, he could, you know, he was. There's, there's no end to what he could do, and and a lot of, and a lot of guys. If you knew the guy, I knew him. You know, you didn't. He, he didn't mess around, and but he was pissed. 
about something, and I mean really pissed, to enough to call out the giant. The giant just just said, you know, okay, well, I'm not gonna do this today. <laughs> Didn't leave the bus, you know, and I guess they wound up working it out. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't surprise me if that actually did happen but i didn't see with my own eyes one thing i noticed about going out with you in the past you never really get the the tough guy reputation but like if someone was rude to you in a bar or something you would always stand up for yourself and i'm sure when you were with hogan there was probably some moments where you had to uh protect him over the years did anything ever happen like that there's yeah. a lot of moments, man. <laughs> so many you wouldn't believe it, and that's that, you know that's something else you know that people nobody knows about. I covered, I watched his ass. I covered him from this way to that way so many times. Got him. <clears throat> there were situations in bars that could have got so ugly and would have been, and and I was always focused in in watching and knew i knew everything my wife gets, goes crazy goes what are you looking at what are you looking at goes i'm i'm just looking i that's what i do I, I watch everything i see everything and i'd get us out of the bar i'd get us out of the way i'd get security i have people all, already boom so that we never not even once really had a serious issue no no big bar fights, no brawls and bars and everything, because I was so far ahead of it that I had the security dragging people out the back door, throwing a beat on them. <laughs> and, and so nothing would ever happen like that, because nothing ever good comes out of bar fights and that kind of stuff. And No, and you wouldn't even see the top guys at bars these days. No, oh, geez. You know, I mean, if there was... If there were to be the, the the social media that's going like it was, you know, I mean, like we have now, you know, back in the eighties, oh, it wouldn't it wouldn't have, would have been the same. I mean, we were rock stars. We we're on MTV. We we're on VH1. We we're we we're all plastered all over everything. And everywhere we went, people they loved us, and it was the most fun time of my life. I'll never forget it. I'll never ever say, you know, thank you, Vince. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to get on TV to to show what I could do and and let the people decide did they like me or not I think they decided they liked me how was working with Adrian Adonis who you oh. started the barber gimmick from him yeah see Adrian I had a little history with Adrian going back to uh uh Vern Gagne and, and uh, Minnesota. I mean, not, not bad history. I know him and Jesse were like partners there. And I was in there for a few months. Uh, I helped Hulk move his family to Minnesota. Uh, his gym, his cars, every, you know, moved him across from, from, uh, from Connecticut to Minnesota. I think. Or, no, no, he wasn't in Connecticut yet. Moved him to Connecticut from there. But <laughs> Adrian was had no self respect. He was he always stunk. He was sweaty and dirty, and he he had food all over him half the time. He was always high, always drunk, and I didn't even really know that they were going to stick with Adrian to the last minute. And he had come to me. He was partners with Dick Murdoch. For a while, did you know? Do you know that, right? Yeah, I remember they had the biker style gimmick there. You know, he had been doing the flower shop, you know, and all that guy got moved. And then he got up with Murdoch, and Murdoch got into his head. And and I met uh, Adrian brought his wife when, when Hulk got married in California, and Anoki was there, and the giant was there. Everybody was there. Adrian was there with his wife. Well, I, I met her for whatever, two minutes, whatever it was. And then Murdoch had convinced Adrian somehow that I was seeing his wife on the side. And so Adrian, like, 
came at me like he was gonna kill me you know like you're you're telling my wife and i said brother if you showed me a picture of her right now i couldn't tell her tell you if that's your wife or it ain't your wife i don't know what your wife looks like i met her one time years ago i have no idea what you're talking about you were saying i mean murdoch had pumped him up because murdoch hated me and paul too both because just because we're the opposite of him and that old school mentality we were good looking bodybuilder like types and he was a big fat beer gut oh you know tobacco chewing redneck and you know he he had convinced adrian of all this bullshit and, and then uh, so i knew when, when adrian came to me with that and you know we didn't fight he didn't he didn't he didn't he said i <laughs> You know, he didn't press it. He didn't jump me because I sure would have been all over him like a cheap suit. Adrian, he actually could move and do things in the ring. You'd never think that a guy with his body type and everything could do. But there's no way on earth that I wanted to have a program with him. But here's the thing. Even more than that, he didn't want to have a program with me. He quit after that WrestleMania three. Boom. After the, the match was over, he got his head thing and he went home. I don't know where he went, but he quit. So that, that first thing I heard was, now you're the barber and um, Adrian's, Adrian quit. So I was like, Whew, that was going to be a nightmare having to put up with him and all his craziness. So boom, he was gone. And then so now it was on me to try to figure out because they gave me no warning they didn't say six months before okay here's what we're, we're going into this wrestlemania thing and then you're going to help piper and we're going to do all this haircut stuff and then afterwards you're going to be the barber and we had all these ideas we're gonna, there was nothing i went to wrestlemania i went home for a couple of days went back to new york rochester new york to the first tv at the war memorial it was an old dumpy rundown crappy building and they came and got me and said we've got to do a photo shoot it i said a photo shoot where, where are we going oh we're going down to a barbershop barbershop okay go to the barbershop. give me this white coat one of the referees name was mark it had me him in the chair and i'm acting like i'm cutting his hair and stuff and they and they just said okay now you're the barber so what does that mean? I'm the barber. There's never been a barber in wrestling before. You know, if there is a haircut match, it's something that happens one time in a territory when a guy's leaving. He gets his haircut. He's got his U-Haul packed in the parking lot. He loads up his wife and his kids after the match, and they drive to the next territory and, you know, and start up. There's no haircutting going on. So where was I going to go with it? So I was ready to quit. And, and I was just going nuts. And Hogan finally found me and says, what, what's going on? I go, I, I quit. They can't, you know, after all, I've just put in two and a half, two years, two and a half, three years of, of, of working my ass off, selling out arenas all over the country and, and everywhere in Canada too. And you're going to just strip that name and gimmick away from me and not, Give me something to, to go on or anything. Just drop this on my, drop this in, in my lap cold. Well, uh, Hogan said, well, what if we do this, Brutus? What if you put a sleeper on them and knock them out, then pull them scissors out and cut their hair? <laughs> I started like, yeah, well, that, that, that could work, but it has to happen every single time when i go to a match on tv and those you know you know what the matches i'm talking about with the jobbers three four minutes boom boom go doing the jobbers everybody's got to get a haircut i mean everybody so when vent when hulk went back to vince with our idea okay boom boom, boom he liked it so i went to florida got the crazy changed up some of the outfits a little bit, got new clothes, more stuff, and then came up with a big shears, a, a 
couple months, took a couple months, and then I came up with a big shears idea, rattling and barber pole. And then the barber thing, basically, they were setting me up to fail, I think. They, they were just, there was nowhere to go. Pat Patterson, he was mad because I didn't do the uh, I'm gay from San Francisco gimmick, and I did the, the Chippendales gimmick instead. And so I think they were setting me up to fail, and then we wound up flip, flipping it, uh, you know, 360 all the way back around and then doing the barber thing and it turned out better than they ever imagined it could <laughs> yeah they gave you some great music too and the character got over where can people follow you now if they want to keep in touch with you and find out what you're doing um boss twitter twitter what's the uh Bruce underscore well, there's no Twitter anymore. Bruce Beefcake underscore. Yeah, it's X. It's called X now. Bruce Beefcake underscore. I have a... TikTok. Bruce Beefcake. TikTok. Bruce Beefcake. Yeah, I have a TikTok account. TikTok, Bruce Beefcake. Facebook is... Edward Leslie. Facebook's under my real name, Edward. Edward Leslie. Instagram. Instagram. Bruce Beefcake. I mean, we're we're out there. I am the commissioner of... Boca Raton Championship Wrestling down in Boca Raton, Florida. And we work uh, usually about uh, every other month. And we have a great little territory down there, a little uh, group of guys. We got a seven foot, we got a giant who's seven foot tall. We got we got guys. Uh, uh, Carrie Morton. Carrie, Carrie Morton. Um, uh, Matt Mashler, Neil the Heel. Matt Mashler, Neil the Heel. And uh, the, the the vampire warrior, Gangrel, he, he helps. Uh, they run. Uh, he runs like a school down there to train guys. We have and Nelio. Nelio. Uh, they have a, a little outfit called CCW where young guys can get experience. They used to run small shows. So it's like, man, things are things are so so great, so good. And thank God that finally the COVID's gone. And, uh, I think I'm going to travel to the UK now for the first time in like five years. And because I was going, I'm over there at least two or three times a year in Germany. And then I was supposed to go to Ireland and Scotland and everything where it was all set up. And then COVID took, Nova Scotia. took all that out. Oh, yeah. I'm going to Nova Scotia. My birthday's in a couple of days. I'm going to Nova Scotia on Friday to stay for about 10 days. And we're going to do all kinds of shows. All around Halifax and in the, in the, in the like a comedy show, like a well, just kind of a question and answer deal. You know, people ask me about stuff and I tell some stories and and and, and stuff, and then uh, some signings and good. Anybody good. up there called Everbright and Google What's your it? name? Everbright for tickets. Everbright, it's Google called. Name. If you go on the internet, the Everbright and Google Brutus, they'll have. Uh, information about where you can get tickets and where the events are there there's just going to be all over the we're just going to be traveling around for like 10 days you'll do great up there in the maritimes because wwe doesn't go go there anymore so it's, well, it's a I hot have been there 10 15 years at least and always did fantastic there i, I loved going to nova scotia the, you know the last time i was there it was so cold out i'm first i'm stuck in a little the hotel on the side of the road and it's like a 20 below zero and it's like it was, <laughs> it was so cool no that was the other guy oh. and uh I, I just haven't been back since we uh, but i was up in the maritime doing a, a golf tournament with ted dibiase uh like two years Maybe ago brothers. and uh it was great there was a canadian ship came in so the canadian navy guys were all there we went on the canadian navy Navy, uh, like, uh, kind of like a small destroyer or cruiser, or whatever they call it. And, you know, and, and uh, had a beer party. <laughs> Go figure. Only in Canada, baby. <laughs> we, were, we were having a big a beer beer fest on the, on, on the boat. Very oh, well, good. well, I just looked it up. It's actually Event Bright, it's called. Event, Event Bright, okay. Bright, uh, it's okay. for Brutus, and he's touring all around Nova yeah. Scotia, so... Go check him out there. And Brutus, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Congratulations on the dark side of the ring. They did, they treated you fairly well. I'll I thought let you so. close this off uh, with whatever you want to tell the fans. Well, I wanted to say 
I, I'm so proud of my wife, Missy. She did a podcast this past week with uh, Monty and Pharaoh. And I guess these guys are well-established guys. And if you, I highly advise you to go on YouTube or wherever you, you can find it. And the, the, they may be, they're offering her a podcast after just seeing her uh, on a couple of podcasts that she, she done. And uh, so she might have her own podcast coming up here, brother. I, I will definitely let you know, drop you a line and let you know, and it'd be something to tune into. And have Neil on his show. You could come, you can have uh, Missy Beefcake next time. 